Hello, hello. Wonderful beings from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Happy Sunday Sangha sitting. Check out all your colorful Sangha city mates. Mm -hmm. Today, today, Pari will do the guided meditation. I'll give a little talk and then Pari, Jake and I will field any questions if there's time. If everyone's ready, Pari. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good, good evening. Good moment. <laughs> um, welcome. Welcome to you all. And uh, so happy uh, to see you and so happy to be here. So. Uh, let us get started. And as we're beginning uh, our meditation practice together, uh, just gently close your eyes. And let's take a few moments. to settle into our meditation posture, whether it's a sitting or whether you're standing or lying down. Make sure that uh, your posture is comfortable. Yet, it's a posture that expresses strength, stability. A posture that supports wakefulness with a balance of ease. <laughs> and stillness. And as you're settling into your posture, you let the mind also settles back into the body with a sense of coming home, arriving home, 
being home. And for now, just being fully aware of the whole body in whatever posture you're in. And as the mind starts to get quieter, perhaps you can start to notice. Notice the movement of the body, breathing. Whole body breathing. Or the movement in the chest or abdomen. Lifting or rising with the in-breath and dropping or falling with the out-breath. And with the attitude of openness, kindness, Curiosity. See if you can just receive the movement, the sensations of the in and out breath as they occur naturally. whether it's long or short, whether it's deep or shallow, light or heavy. However it is, just there's no need to control or trying to make it be in a particular way. We simply receive, observe, and know however it is moment by moment.
You may also notice sensations in other parts of the body. Perhaps in the hands, See if you can let the sensations in the hands be known within the hands. What, say, what sensations can be felt? Perhaps some warmness or coolness, tightness. Softness. Vibration. sensations being felt within the hands. Or maybe there's some sensation of tightness in the neck or in the shoulder. Feel a sensation within that as well. Sensations in the shoulder being felt in the shoulder. back, in the back. Chest, abdomen, bellies. Arms. Legs. Feet. We can just receive the sensations, any sensations that arises in any part of the body. And feeling the sensations from within.
receive any experience, any experience with attitudes of openness, gentle gentleness and curiosity. as they natural, naturally arise and subside moment by moment. sensations, breath, sounds, even thoughts and emotions. Receiving, observing, and knowing in the field of awareness imbued with kindness and care.
Thank you for your practice. Thank you, Pari, for the clear guidance. Today, I'd like to talk a little about <clears throat> how we can, how we can use the same initial motivations of the bodhisattva, the Buddha to be, um, that led to his renouncing the privilege, privileged life he had and to take up the training on the path to awakening. There's many iterations of those early motivations with variances, depending on the sources, uh, the, the text, whether the earliest text or commentaries that came later. But there's some, there's patterns that emerge that that link the different early events in his, the young prince's life that led him to go on this path at a young age. He often said how, how fortunate he was and how um, protected he was. He referred to his young life as, pretty much always being well adorned, well fed, well sheltered. He'd have a, a place, a palace for the rainy season and for the cool season and for the hot season. And he, he said he would, when moving from one place to another, he'd have this, the people serving him on the finest horses, 30 in front and 30 behind, going from one place to the other, or going to a, a, a park someplace, a pleasure park. And that everyone was well fed, all the people serving him, the horses, he himself, there, there was just nothing lacking in his life. Uh, so some of the, the story um, forms say that this came largely from having a very protective life from his father and stepmother uh, when it was predicted that he might become either a universal monarch or a Buddha. Uh, and so it said his, his father didn't want him to see how life really was. Thus, the protection. Nevertheless, because of the force of goodness, the force of paramis, it, perhaps the most profound predicaments of humanity, all humanity, all, all living beings, is the aging process and the process of decay and the dying process. It's hard to wonder how uh, it didn't come upon him in his earlier life, but as the legend goes, his experience of these, what he referred to as his first time experiences of these, um, it makes more sense to me in the mythology that a deva, a celestial being, made it, at least helped make it seem like for the very first time you saw an old person. 
and later for the very first time it made it, it made it seem like the bodhisattva the young prince saw uh, a sick person as if he had never seen it before and then again the same for a dead person So that's actually quite a bit of material that where he, he spoke about that part of his early life and the motivation, uh, the great motivation to renounce the life he had and, and then to become a renunciate uh, for the six years of, of self-training that a Buddha to be undergoes before the self-discovered full, complete, awakening in actually one iteration it said that uh, he, he did the he did the inner work himself it, he was able to cultivate through the directed awareness and sustained awareness what you often hear us talk about as we talk a we chara uh, and and drop into a deep jhana concentration state and from that state, he, he could see and feel how many, if not most people, how they would, how they dealt with these human predicaments of aging, disease, and death. Uh, he said that they distract themselves or defend themselves against the perception of these powerful forces of aging and sickness and the dying process um, through filling their, the, the gratification of the senses, pleasant sights, sounds, sensations, mental images, mental states, and so forth. Um, and that because they were fraught, frightened, often overwhelmed, or felt humiliation at seeing aging, not their own, but seeing others aging and seeing others with disease and other you know, corpses, dead people. Um, but they couldn't turn that awareness inward and realize that they too were subject to the same. So as we know in the world, most people use different kinds of um, distraction, uh, avoidance, denial, uh, just ignorance ignoring what is true, what these predicaments really are. Um, and then just fill the spaces, fill the spaces with whatever helps them continue that lack of heedfulness of how things really are, what's really happening in their mind-body systems. Because they don't examine their own mind and body, uh, the Buddha said, they continue on these samsaric rounds through this life or other lives in the future, uh, that out of the ignorance, there is still craving to be happy, to be peaceful, but the craving leads them in the wrong direction at things that are fleeting and empty just passing ephemeral sights, sounds, sensations, and mental phenomena. So as he would be speaking to his disciples in years later, he said he turned the examination on himself and realized that, uh, you know, whether they were phantoms created by the celestial being, the deva, or whether they were from his own um, directed and sustained awareness uh, that 
took what he experienced as someone's aging disease or death to be his own destiny, that he himself was not exempt from that. And, and that spurred, that ig ignited much of the energy, much of the forces that came together and led to his, the great, it's called the great renunciation and his, his faith in there being a path to ultimate liberation, peace, Nibbana. In one, in one of the texts, he talks about realizing his own vulnerability in regard to old age, decay, and death, uh, and the way he presented that was what I think of as the wisdom of vulnerability. Uh, he made himself so raw and open to feel uh, not just a projection of what he observed when he saw old, an old person, a sick person, or a dead person, but how he immediately took, took it in and knew that that person's humanity was his own humanity and that, that he would not avoid that. It would not, he was subject to the very same thing. And unless he was under the spell of ignorance, like many, are most that he saw, most people, where then craving takes over, craving to get something pleasurable or craving, craving to stay away, to avoid the reality of aging and sickness and, and death. That level of vulnerability, attunement, sensitivity, so he, he, he would teach, he said, on being young and under the, under the spell of ignorance, meaning greed, hatred, delusion, all of them. Um, those untrained tend toward being proud and conceited and become negligent, you know, not heedful of being young, the intoxication of youth. And therefore they do not cultivate the holy life. And on being healthy, he said, people tend to be proud, conceited and become negligent because of sense desires as distractions and the ignorance that covers the craving uh, they too do not cultivate the holy life. And on being alive, he said, most people who are alive carry a pride and a conceit and a negligence for thousands of sunsets before they too experience death and usually not so prepared for that death. So his wake up call after his own awakening uh, and he traveled to give his first Dhamma talk on setting the wheel of the Dhamma in motion, uh, the discourse of the Four Noble Truths uh, in describing Dukkha it largely rests on these qualities, these innate human qualities of our own aging and of our own vulnerability to illness and our own dying process. He said he did not when he was, before he left at age 29, he said, 
he did not allow his youth and his health and being alive to distract him from a clear perception of what, what aging is without the defenses against feeling aging, you know, without blocking it off, without the distractions. He didn't allow the, potenti the potentiality of his own illnesses to be a distraction and the inevitable process of dying. He did not allow that to cloud his perception of what the basic predicament of humanity was. And therefore, his motivation was really pure. He, he knew that he wanted to know what was beyond. So one of the iterations of these teachings were called, uh, in some cases called the great events or the four heavenly messengers because of the, the deva, the heavenly celestial being that made the appearance of them happen so that he could viscerally grasp what, an, what the aging felt like internalize that even though he was still young and internalize illness as a visceral experience that he too would be ill in the future and the dying process as well that he would be a corpse at some point and, and thus avoid the strong intoxication or enchantment with, with youth, with health, with being alive. And in, in the iteration I'm referring to, he, there's a fourth event or a fourth messenger when he again goes out to see what's beyond the protection of the palaces that had been providing him with uh, all the sense pleasures of, of food and sensuality and, and uh, people always waiting on him. So he did not have to experience any suffering on that level. So the, the fourth time he went out, it said, he saw a monastic in meditation. In some, in some versions, the monastic is sitting in the shade of a tree. And in some walking very mindfully, almost like walking with the feet not touching the ground. And his sense was that this person has gone beyond these predicaments of aging and illness and death, that this person was on that path of training to take you uh, beyond the, that dichotomy of life and death of rising and passing. And, and thus, that kind of finalized his, his deepest faith that there was a path and that he could fulfill it to the very highest level uh, of awakening. Yesterday I was um, at a class I go to and the, the teacher is trained in, in Pilates and also in dance and ballet um, and, kind of, and very into the human body, uh, makes drawings, very intricate drawings, you know, right down to the level of uh, how our bones are, are like carried in a network of like basketry and our, our bones through space uh, as a, and right down to the nuanced, nuanced neural network. Neural networks 
are like um, activations across these pools of neurons. That's what happens when we, that's the Western scientific view of what's going on when we see, when we hear, when we feel things, experience things in the body and, and the neurons that are activated in the thinking process, our mental moods, you know, they're just always happening. I, I, I Seeing these drawings that um, my teacher has made, there's such incredible patterns, you know, actually far more vivid and alive than something you might see in, in books, of which also has many and often opens one up to an illustration to show what's happening, you know, when, when we move. So, um, so not only work on the reformer you know, in the Pilates, um, but also moving around because she has that dance experience, just walking to and fro and walking in a circle, walking real slowly. Uh, I mean, she's never been on a retreat. She has no idea how, how much this is like real mindful walking, you know, where the intention coming from deep within to just lift our leg and then to move it forward through space and to lower it in place and step forward. This is how she was having us, having me move. So it felt really at home. <laughs> And, um, and then at one point, she put a standing mirror in the middle of the floor. And, and I sort of uh, curved myself around one side of it so that my left side, my injured side came around and I could see in the mirror, uh, my left arm, my left leg, you know, part of my face. And the whole back wall is a mirror. So if I looked that way, if I looked behind the standing mirror, I could see my right side. And then she took some long stem flowers and she was in the opposite side, opposite side of the standing mirror and she, she brushed either side, you know, kind of starting from my shoulder, going down my arm, which I could very easily feel on the, on the right side. And the left side, she moved the long stem flowers down, but didn't actually touch my arm. It was away from the body. I could see that it was away from the body. And I just relaxed and she, the intention, she said was to let the neuronal networks, those activations across the pool of neurons um, do the work like do the translation, let the, the neuronal networks of the brain and nervous system feel the sensations I was feeling on the right side as she brushed with the flowers. And it, in my interior, just make the association. So I would have a sense of the sensations that might be there had she been actually touching my left side. Eventually she did touch the left side and I could feel sensations. They not weren't as crisp and sharp and defined as the right side because of the numbness I'm often experiencing or the intense tingling and discomfort. But I just having me do this work on the subtlest, subtlest level, you know, that I, I could only sort of conventionally conceptualize where my real effort was to do nothing and just feel the semblance of sensation when she wasn't touching me. And then as she did touch me very lightly at first with the flowers on my left side, to feel what I could feel, you know, intermittently with the numbness and like interrupted sensation I might 
I might say, as she went down and doing that kind of many times and uh, continuing to make the association however I could with this body mind. Going back to the right side, feeling that, going back to the left side and feeling when there was no touch, like the neuronal pathways working to be a receptor to the potential of touch. And then when she did touch, to the degree that I felt that along with the numb sensations or the intense tingling and so forth, it was just really, for me, it was real fascinating. It's really interesting. And I felt like, well, that's a good, it's a good teaching. You know, and I've been trying to work in recent years with aging and illness and the dying process as a positive and powerful motivation for our training, for our practice to train our awareness, not to lose sight of the human predicament ever. And, and you know, the, the startling sense of his, his, his understanding in, while still in his twenties, that the intoxication with, with youth and health and being alive was, a huge um, sh uh, magic show and a massive distraction from what was real. And his motivation was to kind of stay with what was real, that true felt experience that upon which staying with leads to liberation, you know, without which we can't know the first noble truth. We can't know dukkha if we don't know this reality of aging process, can't accept it. You know, we, we talk about phenomena a lot, sankara, our, our, our dhammas with a small d as just being the felt sense experience of the body and emotions, mental formations, sounds, visual experience, and so forth. These dhammas are, are, are sankharas. Only at that point where we can be still and fully accept that, fully accept that all the sankharas are happening but at any time, but particularly as a training for when we start feeling, you know, that first moment, you may or may not remember when you realized that you're getting old. <laughs> but wait a minute, I used to run faster than that, or I used to be able to balance better than that. Or I could hold my breath longer than that underwater, or I could I surf for a much longer session, you know, I just I must be out of shape. But no matter what we do, we come up again and again with our limitations until we acknowledge, oh yeah, it's not the same. This, this is aging. This is, the, this is the truth of aging. And well, wait a minute, how, you know, how does that feel? Like it's, it's real, it's not out there and it's not happening to other people. It's happening right here and now. And uh, and the first time that we might have had some major sickness, illness, injury, and feeling the vulnerability around that at first, maybe a vulnerability under uh, with an undercarriage of 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 fright, and later maybe the wisdom of vulnerability, where yes, uh, the body goes in and out of balance all the time, and sometimes quite a bit out of balance, you know, with a kind of injury, uh, a sprain or a strain or a break um, or, or more serious, like a stroke. The, the patterning of 
uh, when she makes these drawings, my trainer, um, and, and the ones I've seen in the books, and, and the ones I felt yesterday, looking in the mirror and, and feeling the patterns. And sometimes I had that experience I mentioned a few weeks ago when I talked about um, synesthesia, which happens when um, we hear sounds, but see, see colors with those sound moments. You know, when we listen to music, sometimes it's going to move from receiving the lovely integrated symphonic sound vibrations, a shift from that to seeing colors. And likewise, yesterday, with feeling the sensations um, eventually, because it stood there for like 20, 40 minutes. Uh, I was seeing light. I was feeling light when I was touched by those flowers, my eyes closed, and then with them open as well. And then here with the very slightest brush too, it's almost like the neurons that couldn't quite feel with the same clarity and crispness as the right side was then experiencing light or even sound because all the while in the background is this soundtrack of Tibetan bells. So my whole body was vibrating. I could feel the, the deep tone Tibetan bell in my bones. And the other higher pitch sounds, I could feel just kind of uh, like a waterfall rushing through the body. As if we were like when you stand under a waterfall and feel that constant rush. So that's, that's that. Uh, Synesthesia, synesthesia, that where, where sense doors are interchangeable almost, happens not infrequently in deep meditation. And it really doesn't, um, doesn't mean anything in particular. It, it means that the concentration is good and it means that the meditation is unfolding as it should. It's not something to strive for. And it's not something that if you haven't experienced it before, it doesn't mean you're not progressing in the, in the meditation, in concentration and insight progression. It's just kind of what happens. But the, the patterning reminded me too of, um, you know, when you see starlings flock and, and make those incredible patterns in the sky, hundreds or thousands of them at a time, I think it's called uh, murmuration and they uh, move as if under one consciousness uh, very swiftly and there's like perfect patterns like a symphony so, but it's a symphony of of movement and light uh, that, that's that's how I experience that and I kind of have, it's helping to bring that to in a positive way to aging as a vehicle of awakening illness as a means to have liberating insight. And the death process, which we're all feeling the pull of at one time or another, uh, this last pandemic endless year is a perfect opportunity to turn the awareness on these things and feel that, you know, there has been so much death around the planet and uh, probably perhaps we all know of at least one or a few people who have either had the virus or have passed away from it. So the, the wake up, the wake up call or opportunity for everyone is to realize that this is, this is nature. This is, this is what happens and that it happens so universally. So in, in such a wide um, pandemic scenario, those of us who ha have had the, this training and have had um, this practice to lean back on, 
likely made more use of it and less of the defenses, less of the intoxication of being alive or being healthy are still feeling the young side of our being, which we can all feel at any age. At a young age, we can feel old and we can uh, feel sick or feel like we're dying. At an old age, we can still feel the young aspect, young aspects in our heart. And even with illness, we feel ourselves, our systems, you know, the neuroplasticity of our mind body um, trying to repair. Like I've used those examples of uh, kintsugi, uh, kin as gold and sugi as the joined are to repair. It's the, that art, uh, Japanese pottery of repairing a broken bowl um, using lacquer, uh, like black or red lacquer, and then sprinkling it with, with gold dust. Or, or it can be silver dust or platinum dust, can be any dust. And the broken areas are stronger than before. They make the bowl stronger than before it was broken. It's not likely to break again in that same seam. Instead, we, we see a seam of glittering gold, or a, a seam of shimmering silver. In the same way, we can regard our vessel uh, as broken. You know, we're all broken in a way, and all humanity is broken in a way. Kind of how the, the karma of our, our planet and our civilizations have unfolded in recent centuries, and millennia, uh, and gets amplified sometimes, like this past year and a half and get the opportunity to, to telescope in or to uh, expand outward and see, you know, from a certain geographic distance w without tending toward the distraction of avoidance or defending against the feelings or the intoxication with um, filling ourselves with pleasant sights and sounds and sensations and mental phenomena. Instead, we get that direct opportunity to appreciate the strength that comes from brokenness, like in these uh, kintsugi bowls, the, the neuroplasticity repair that makes us stronger than ever, even as we're aging, or even as we're going through uh, illness, or in the dying process, the beauty, the strength, the richness of that from these powerful teachings of the Buddha. He just asked us to, to have enough seclusion to see those three particular facets of all moment to moment experience that, that particularly the subtlest Anicca nature. How quickly things are arising and then not lasting and then vanishing slowly, but disappearing the moment they arise. That level of Anicca. That's the insight. That's the interstitial space that allows us to be able to hold these predicaments, to hold our aging body as it is in the aging process, our illness in the illness process, or the dying in our dying process. Finding that space comes from the insight practice. We use the Brahma Viharas also to create the gentle space, like Pare was guiding us in the meditation to, to hone the attitudes of kindness and care. That too makes that same interstitial spaciousness uh, to, to hold the vulnerability and the fragility of our body, mind, body, being. Uh, and secondly, the, the dukkha, nature, because things, because things are changing so rapidly that we can't even hold on, there's that sense of just grabbing at ephemeral phenomena and the unsatisfactoriness of that, the dukkha nature of that. 
And then, so how in all this disappearing ephemeral phenomena, can there be any control? When, when as soon as we touch anything with awareness, a, a sensation, a sound, a, a visual experience, uh, a thought, it's gone. So that uncontrollability and the, the emptiness of any self-agency there, th those are the doorways. Those are what make makes these predicaments tenable as motivations, as stepping stones for awakening. And we don't need to avoid. We don't need to fear. This is nature. It's nature that aging happens. We've seen it before in our families. We've seen it in a, a larger group of friends and community. We've seen it with our, our, our pets. We've seen aging, illness, and death. We've all seen it. And if we can just not let it be out there only and be either defended against it or critical of those who are frightened and humiliated, rather bring it in. Oh, yes, it's the same, it's the same for me. I'm in this same process as all living beings of aging, decay, and the dying process. So I'm going to uh, stop there. Thank you for your practice. And uh, Jake and Pari and I are happy to take any questions you might have about about your practice, about your meditation today, or practice questions in general that you may have. We want to inspire your training. We want to inspire your capacity to hold what's true. Harry, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, thank you, Steve. It, it's definitely not out there anymore. It's processes if they ever were. And uh, I don't think I'll ever be the same after, after COVID, after three weeks in the hospital and being near death. Um, there's a tendency like Humpty Dumpty to try and, you know, put it all back together and get back. And, um, but there's also the Dharmic process. Uh, in the hospital, I found it very hard to sit and lying down, but sit. But it was impossible not to be aware of the four foundations as, as they kind of laced their way through my uh, pretty fragile being. And uh, mm. It is a gift. It's a, it's a hard gift. It's kind of a terrible gift. Uh, in a way, but it's a beautiful gift. And uh, I appreciate what you said. And I, I also appreciate hearing from someone who's a contemporary dealing with serious health issues. It's, uh, when it, I think it's harder for young people, not impossible, but harder for young people to really fully appreciate um, this, this aging process until you really get slammed in the face with it. Uh, even though I'm, I'm rebuilt in a sense, I can do
do pretty much what I used to do. In fact, everything that I used to do. I um, the sense that it can all end very suddenly is very pronounced. And that, that's a real blessing to, to focusing me on the present moment and, and, and the process. And so thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Yes, I, I see. I see that you've and have seen that you've been altered by your experience. And, and so you give voice right from that very vulnerable experience, seeing what you could or couldn't do with, with the practice when you're in the hospital, you know, and the repair that's happened since. So it's powerful. It's powerful to give voice to that and meaningful because, you know, as you said, you've, you've been able to retrain and regain um, most, if not all of the abilities you had before, but still you have retained that degree of vulnerability that has changed you forever. And that, so when you speak to these issues, it comes from, it comes from that, your own personal and direct experience. It matters, it makes a difference. People need to hear that. It's like the, the long meditation on death that yeah. can come at any time from anywhere, from any disease. That 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 uh, the thing I try to do that when I do formally say it's I, I can say without thinking about it too much. I think about it, too much, but it's a tremendous blessing. Yeah. Yeah. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Your hand up, Tan. Hi. Hi. S Steve, um, I have had problem with nostalgia, especially at the time where we used to live at the Alki home where we hosted the Sunday sitting. And that period of time is, is really, um, I miss that time and miss that home a lot. So lately I've been you know, thinking about that period of time and missing it a lot. So I try Thanks, to note Tom. that, but you know, it's it's not easy. It's a good memory. I remember the Alki home and the many Sangha sittings we had there. Uh, and it's natural to have such memories and to miss things of the past. It's a natural part of our aging and memory process. It's okay. Just notice that you're having those memories or feel the emotion of the nostalgia. I, I recall you mentioned that a couple of weeks ago as well, feeling nostalgia. So it sounds like it comes up for you, that emotion of nostalgia comes up for you and uh, just supporting you in being able to, to recognize that and then feel the emotion in your body. And if you've seen the Alki Street House and our su Sunday sittings and potluck meals, just be aware of, of those memories and visions, appreciations. 
So there's nothing that you need to, you don't need to note it away. It's not a problem. Yeah, so Bodhi Tree Steer there, we came to visit uh, a couple of weeks ago and the Bodhi Tree is, is really flourishing and yeah, doing very well. Good. Thanks, Tan. Thank you, Steve. Arlene, did you have a question? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I've been doing um, a meditation um, this week, um, but with uh, with Bhikkhu um, An Analia, I, I may not be pronouncing it, on the Sami Padana uh, Sutra. And we're doing the body scan, and I always had trouble with it. And I am finding it absolutely wonderful. I mean, today we're doing depth, but just. Um, even before that, to go the first day, he just kind of has you focus on uh, skin, flesh, and uh, bones, and you go up and down your body. And I, you know, with aging, I avoid have avoided mirrors forever. Uh, and in terms of skin, and uh, you know, not feeling very good about it, about how I, I am aging. And so it's been fascinating feeling the skin and feeling the flesh. And I'm not as physically you know, fit as I used to be. And before flesh used to be, you know, extra flesh was, I, I didn't feel good about it. And, uh, and now it, I'm, I'm feeling it in the body and also now with today, um, you know, visualizing the skeleton and, and the, you know, how, uh, what will happen to, to me and what will happen to this body. And I am amazed at how comforting this practice is for me. Um, and the other thing that happened that was really very important is we're in small groups and one person was talking about um, how she's been having seizures and she had two seizures on, on Zoom, okay? So what, the participants, and there was no teacher there, um, the participants there were seeing this experience of somebody really um, losing control of their, their body. And then she would come back and talk and, you know, and we would react, you know, do the best at reacting. And then, um, it happened again. And what struck me as how val valuable it was to me, I mean, not initially, I felt bad that I couldn't help her. I, you know, did we say, and, and at a certain point, the group is cut off. So it, it, it was cut off. But I felt like how witnessing somebody suffering, you know, physically suffering. And um, where normally I probably would have, you know, I would have been okay, you know, I would, would have responded okay, but I would have kind of been holding my breath afterwards. And I, which I did afterwards, but then I kind of, and, and that happened two times, which I'm sorry for her and I admire her for being in this 
in this small, I mean, she didn't know, but it's volunteered to go into these groups. And so I, it was like kind of amazing the experience and of seeing somebody going through the, the losing of control of their body. And it's not that I haven't, I have, you know, big physical problems myself. And I've always kind of felt much more concerned about what other people would think of me than about what, you know, I, my tendency would be to hide that. So it's been an incredible experience to, you know, when, when, um, the teacher said that this going through the body and you know that and and dealing with that and dealing with death would be um, he described it as the most valuable meditation for him and I, to me it was like okay I'm gonna do this so anyway. I, I don't know if, and, and your talk was just, it was so incredible that it happened today, both of these things. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Very clear. Anything you want to say, Pari or Jake? Soon. One more question. It's strange that for me, I'm always curious about death. And it seems like um, every night before I go to bed, when I lie down, I will say, this might be my last breath to see, to prepare for death. And then I just fall asleep. So I, ne I can never be <laughs> able to see the transition. So when I think of this, I'm curious. I'm, I don't have this fear. I feel like it's um, also because I believe in rebirth. It's like a, a door to another thing to know. Yes, I understand. So is there another better way to prepare for this? You're doing it. Thank you, Steve. Every breath may be mm -hmm. the last. <laughs> yeah, I keep saying that, but like Michelle told me, it's just my entourage. <laughs> Every death might be the last one. And, but still, it's amazing because it can happen anytime, any moment. Right. That's right. 
yeah, that conventional death can happen anytime, any moment. In meditation, we're noticing births and deaths every moment. Our, our entire system, the whole nama, rupa, phenomena of body, mind are kind of pulsing, flashing into a momentary experience and vanishing. So that's really helpful. That for me is personally is a is also a powerful um, preparation to see, understand, and sense momentary birth and death. Mm -hmm. It makes space for when, as our bodies inevitably age, decay, and pass away. Pari or Jake, anything to add? It's not meant to be a morbid <laughs> topic. <laughs> <laughs> it can, like you, Sun, I have a curiosity. I have a curiosity about how the neurons work and how, how the stroke occurred and a curiosity about aging. And it doesn't feel like a, a fight to change anything or fix anything. When I do my practices, it feels like it continues to fulfill and feed that curiosity with kindness. Meta. Yeah, I love Meta. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, uh, whenever something happens, just like may I be happy, may all beings be happy. And right. That's hope. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I've mentioned before, you know. It need not be a, a somber activity. The dying process, uh, Michelle or I have a number of times mentioned my mother's passing. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. of asking you to say again, like how did you um, help your mom pass away? Another time. Not today. But it was delight. It was a delight, and it was more like a birth mm -hmm. than a death. But it's everything that we've been saying. It's just the the willingness to show up, to be present. Mm -hmm. You know, our own our curiosity about ourselves and our compassion to hold others in their vulnerability and their in their um, aging, illness, and dying process. And I really appreciate that you did your best to keep um, Vuna at home. Yeah. Yes, I'm grateful for that. She wanted to be at home. Mm -hmm. So thank you for setting an example on stage. <laughs> You're welcome, and thank you, Sun. The Dhamma blessings to everyone. Look at everyone. It might be the last time you see some of us. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, and thank you, Perry, for the instructions. So beautiful today. Love it. Yes, Satu, 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 Perry. Aloha.